Going in. I might have an eavesdrop on this one if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Let me push that. Good to go. We're good. So I'm delighted to introduce Steve uh, Gardner Collins from Visit to Gloucestershire. Um, can, I, can I just suggest everyone puts their microphones on mute as we go through this the early stage? Um, what we're going to do is uh, in, get Steve to talk about uh, the opportunity for rural communities at this time. Because actually, one of the constant conversations coming out is that the, as just as city economies may struggle, there could be real opportunity for uh, each region and for the rural economy to really grow again. Steve represents Visit Gloucestershire, so we'd really be interested in his perception of this and his perspective and what he's seeing and the changes taking place. And then we're going to open up to general discussion because it's actually what we're finding. This is actually one of the really key discussion points because so many people do not expect to see more than 60% of our employees returning to the workspace and people working remotely. So will this give a real injection to local economies? Question. So Steve, can I bring you in at this point to say some words? Yeah, I'll share my but screen cool. actually, just so everyone can, oh. Uh, says host has disabled share, scrap share screen. Can, who's, who's the host? Could you, un if not, I'll talk about it. <laughs> I mute myself, I mute myself. Tell me what you need me to. Oh, I just need to be able to share. Have you got, it says, um, yes. Well, oh, do I have to, can you not share it on, on yours? Because it's going to bring up my screens. Uh, no, it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. Hi. I don't know what that means, but I can talk about it anyway. Um, I was going to give some visuals of what Paul Gloucestershire has been through in the last couple of months. Yeah, I don't know how I, um, how I oh, do well. Well, I'll talk through it. If you manage to, let me know. Thank you, Steve. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, well, morning. I'm um, Steve Gardner Collins, and I am the current chair of Visit Gloucestershire, the Visit Gloucestershire Partnership. Um, for those of you who may or may not have heard of it, we're the destination management organisation for Gloucestershire as a county. Gloucestershire is made up of, as uh, many of you probably know, the Cotswolds the Seven Vale and the Forest of Dean. And I'll just give some history to uh, 2020 before we move on to our, our current rural community efforts. Uh, back in February, you would have seen uh, that particularly the Forest Dean and Wales were hit incredibly hard by the bad weather. Um, and I had some images of the extent of deepness of that flooding uh, and the impact that that had on communities, uh, our rural communities out in that neck of the woods. They managed to dry out in effect by uh, March and uh, we had about a week, I think, of dry, clear trading opportunity. And then we had to close. So we went into a, a lockdown on the 23rd of March there or thereabouts. So the poor forests and the communities out there have had a terrible start to the year and remain closed. Not only were they impacted because for us our season is very much up until about October half term and then from about then onwards we're very quiet. We do get a lot of walkers uh, who are couples or part of groups that see us through the uh, November, December, January, February but it you know, it gets really cold and wet and we're high up, so we often get sleet. And if we, if I live on a hill, so we're often snowed on as well. So you compound all those pressures through the winter and um, flooding through February and then coronavirus in March. So just what uh, the Forest of Dean needed. Uh, other parts of the county were equally affected. So you'll know Tewkesbury with its two rivers that meet floods annually that's become an annual since 2007 those communities who are experienced can adapt and really do overnight 
continue to operate uh, very quickly when they're used to the flooding. Um, but places like the forest that don't see it too often were, were, were terribly hit all of a sudden and weren't able to come out of it quick enough before March. Um, so, yeah, I've been talking over the last eight weeks about this lockdown situation that we're in and everybody's in. But as we start to turn our attention to being encouraged to go out and experience the countryside, places like uh, Bought on the Water, Stow on the Wold, their communities are flagging their concern over this influx of tourists to those honeypot locations that often are, uh, have often experienced over tourism in the past. And right from last Monday, when we were pretty much allowed back out, instantly they were hit with visitors and we're unprepared at the moment. Uh, in a part of my presentation, it says that um, public facilities are closed um, and car parks are closed. And we've had some press over the last 24 hours about the pressure that the local authorities are under to just open public services so that as we go into this bank holiday weekend and into warmer weeks ahead, that actually, regardless of um, and we're not discounting social distancing efforts, but we they can't work quick enough to get ready for these tourists that are already landing on us. We know that the marketing of Western Supermare and uh, Devon and Cornwall has been throughout to, to, to stay away. And we've echoed those messages. But the countryside and the vast areas of Gloucestershire are favourable to those that want to get out and experience the, the outdoor again. So we are probably going to become a bit of a victim in the early, the early stage of this influx before we can get prepared. I work with the local authorities and the county council and have been recovery planning since the 20th of March. And I don't think they're going to be able to work quick enough over the next week or two to, to prepare. Uh, given that we're still waiting for more guidance on uh, the setup of high streets and, and what social distancing means within the country environment. You're kind of already semi two metres apart if you can get through the crowds uh, on the country lanes, but um, it doesn't go without its, with its uh, concern. But for rural communities, those that live in big, uh, in small villages, but with big, uh, demand for tourism they are they are concerned so uh yeah we're just we're just working with those communities at the moment listening they were talking about maybe barricading roads at one stage because they really are and were panicking about being too overwhelmed but we've managed to work with them and to try to look at the whole of Gloucestershire and encourage people to come and visit but experience everything that the county has to offer not just go after those honeypot locations. Uh, I'll just default back slightly because uh, in the introduction uh, for me I've, I've negated to cover off uh, things like the Cheltenham Festival um, obviously with the coronavirus and that's uh, I'll just step back a little bit to that, that time in March when we've just come off the back of flooding the county really needed an injection of, of money and the Cheltenham Festival itself the revenue it generates is phenomenal but uh, with that, the race course took guidance, uh, followed the, the guidance off the back of the scientists and the government advice, and that event continued to happen. In the press, there were um, images of what Chelton looked like in terms of its coronavirus outbreak and how it was affecting Gloucestershire, and there is a, there is a particular postcode around the, around the festival that was hit quite hard. We lost a publican actually just down the road from the race course. Now at the moment, uh, listening to like our MP Alex Chalk and the race course feedback and government's feedback, the accountability and the effect that that has had will no doubt be investigated further down the line. There are obviously concerns over that event taking place, what that went on to do to this spread of the virus. But nobody is uh, held, holding the race course themselves accountable for going ahead in the sense that they were following the guidance and um, were able to, for, they, they were able to, to carry out the event itself. So I've, I've no doubt scientists and uh, media and investigations will take place, but they, they stand to the 
to the operation that they carried out and all the necessary hand cleaning and um, all the different uh, injection of um, uh, added. They had like uh, big vans of sanitizers and uh, other uh, PPE that you could buy at the time. So they were just following the guidance and I think they, they just went with it as did the Liverpool football match and then obviously went into lockdown on the, the, the following Monday. Uh, I'll leave it at there because you're all on mute. So I'll stop talking and uh, give everyone an opportunity to maybe ask some questions. Well, let's, let me uh, see. Let me just ask some questions just to get things kicked off because it has been an interesting journey, hasn't it? As you rightly say, it's been a year that won't be forgotten. Um, mm. There's a lot of very concerns by visitors in Fluxen. Um, but at the same time, doesn't it give up the local economies a real boost, the fact you're having this? And how do you get that balance right? We have a, uh, an opportunity to work with Gloucestershire as a whole and to, we're working on marketing and PR over the next week to um, follow the guidance, the ongoing guidance that we get updates on, but to really try and push tourism across the county and work together so that the message is not to visit these well-known places like Bolt on the Water and Stowe on the Wall that have historically faced this over tourism issue and our marketing and our PR will focus on other other parts of the county particularly around the Forest of Dean that's now all tidied up and ready to go again that again that's outdoor open space but I live on a hill I was up at Cheese Rollers uh, two days ago vast amount of space a beautiful wooded uh, area where i didn't see too many people but also when there were people around there's different tracks that go off in different directions so um, i've no doubt as we get into the june the first uh, particularly and it's it's half term this week so it'd be interesting to see if the weeks do get busier as expected but our marketing and our messages will be to visit <laughs> and not just focus on the Cotswolds, as is the biggest brand in our, our area. And are you positive about, because obviously one of the discussions at the moment is each region could do very well, but people are not returning to London or into the major cities. Um, are you positive about what you're seeing emerge at the moment? Because actually it should give each region a real extra influx of income. Yeah, I mean, we're blessed that we're rural, so without having this, we haven't got a main, apart from Gloucester, which is our city, um, and albeit that in the last 24 hours, we haven't had any um, uh, cases reported for the virus. And with, I don't, my, my neighbours are too far apart for me to know uh, when they're home and when they're not, but we're much more spread out here. So there is this, um, I haven't, I've been at home for nine weeks and I haven't needed to be in touch with anybody. We've been out and about as, with the kids in, in the open space, in the woods, in the taking advantage of where we live. And there's plenty of uh, open countryside. And I, and I think that we've got enough to spread people around and hopefully not be too affected. But I can't hold anyone to that. It, it, we may be too overwhelmed and our messages will need to change. But certainly because London is being encouraged not to stay in London, I have no doubt that, that we will be that appeal destination. Andrew, Do you think I, Andrew can I bring you in? So I was going to bring you in here. Just to introduce yeah. Andrew. Andrew. Andrew's the founder of Triggerfish PR. I am. And Andrew. actually, and it was Andrew who started me on this discussion. So do you want to say a few words? Yeah, I was just, I, I find the whole subject fascinating, particularly because um, I live in the sticks. Um, and just some of the animosity that I see from local villagers saying, get out of my town. I don't want, I don't want your disease here. And you just question how um, the rural economy can come back when you've got that kind of feedback. And it, I just thought it was really interesting to hear what Steve was saying about um, you need to work with everybody. But I still think, you know, there is so much animosity out there. If you look at Cornwall, they're putting up barricades you mentioned that people were talking about barricading um the sort of the local areas how do you get over that the reality of of the situation is that we have to have a, a sense of normality and freedom and being locked in lockdown for so long we want to go away people will want to get out and go somewhere 
Um, and the balance between those that live in these rural locations and the tourists coming in. I get that the barricade is certainly a conversation that they've, they've all considered, but the reality is we have to put up messaging that, that continues to push people across the county, not just to focus on the marketing around Horton and Stowe, who are particularly very concerned um, over their over tourism issues that they've had in the past. I do also think that I don't want to take my family and my children to somewhere where I know has a reputation for being incredibly busy. So if our messages are, don't go to these places that you know are historically busy. Go to somewhere else that's a bit off the off the, the track, and you'll be minimising your own risk rather than thinking, let's go to Borton because it's a lovely place to visit because you know it's going to be potentially busy. And take the risk. Lauren, can I bring you in here? Because I know in your village, a lot of your villages are struggling with people coming in. Yeah, so I'm in Upper Slaughter. Um, lower Slaughter, go sign, go home, village clothes. And you're right, even for locals, it's quite difficult to, um, to, to see that because we're a very um, open environment. But, but it has been quite scary to see people because for the last, what, eight weeks, we know all the faces in the village. So when there are new faces, it, it is scary and, and a lot of people are worried about that. And so for us, again, the is about how do we have businesses here too that need the tourism to survive. And Vicky, you mentioned yesterday on a different chat that we, we were on, um, and I don't know if we can bring you in, on, on how, because we can't do the community because um, we're told to sort of be, stay away, whether there are opportunities for rural environments like ours, um, for the hubs for businesses that could drive other other economies, not just tourism, to these um, little, well, maybe a bit bigger than mine, but uh, smaller towns. Yeah, what's, what's interesting, Lauren, is um, I live in a village called Watlington, and um, the nature of the high street is that it is all real little shops, most of which serve food one way or the other. So they've stayed open all the way through. And they have opened their arms and their hearts to social distancing. They've done an incredible job with it. All the pavements outside all the shops are marked up now permanently with brightly colored tapes so we know where to stand. Um, when there's something going on or a queue gets particularly big, there's always somebody keeping an eye out, coming out from one of the shops and making sure it's all right. Just this week, um, the deli in the village has been open all the way through because it serves food that you can take away. They've moved to delivering all sorts of different types of food to houses all over the area. They reopened their coffee takeaway in their cafe, again with social distancing. So Watlington is incredibly vibrant. The car park's been open all the way through. Uh, the RSPB, sorry, the National Trust car parks have been closed. They've just started to reopen now. Um, the business centre in Watlington, which is a drop-in centre for local businesses, um, is temporarily closed, although they've been supporting virtually. But, you know, listening to what you're saying, there's been no animosity here because they've welcomed people and then controlled them when they were here. The whole village has simply worked together to do that. Now, I realise um, if we were mobbed by the kind of numbers that end up in Morton on the Marsh, Morton on the Water, I used to avoid Morton as a child for that same reason, because Mother always used to be horrified by the number of coaches that pitched up during the summer holidays. But, um, sorry, just one point and then I'll shut up. I'm a member of RSPB and National Trust and we've been getting emails through this week saying we will be reopening, but toilets will be closed, coffee shops will be closed. And what does concern me is when all these people get to all these places and there's nothing there for them, whereas actually, potentially, if you took the Watlington approach, and I do realize it's a matter of scale, and you manage the toilets with queuing, and you manage the coffee shops with queuing and social distancing in the way that a lot of our businesses are getting ready for now, perhaps there's a balance that can be achieved. But it does worry me 
to your point, Steve, that there's a whole load of people that are just going to arrive in these places and there's no facilities for them. And what do you do when you get there and there's not even toilets open? I'm really not sure. Yeah, you've raised a great point. We experienced uh, on that very first Monday last week <clears throat> that um, the, the general public were turning up in one of the chipping villages and uh, they were using residence gardens and you can imagine the impact that then has on the response by the Wednesday when the residents are saying oh my goodness like you need to reopen public facilities but the district council haven't yet managed to uh, come up with a plan or hadn't at that stage come up with a plan in the first week to reopen those facilities and adopt the new measures that were they, they were potentially having to um, adapt to so um yeah that that was the initial kind of <clears throat> what are these what's going to happen to our village if these tourists arrive and our facilities aren't open i have since today and over the last 24 hours been receiving wow, notifications wow. to say that the services are now open, now open. Uh, or reopening. Uh, reopening so i think over no, the I course think... so i've got um back feed coming through so i can hear myself twice <laughs> um, no but uh, as the public services do open, and I think that the, the district councils and the local authorities are going to up the pace on sorting all of that out, because um, whereas they didn't want to, well, they just need the guidance, but <clears throat> they've needed the, the time to prepare for it. Alex, can I bring you in here from Scottish perspective? Alex, you there? Yeah, absolutely. I'm here now. Hi, everyone. Because actually, one of the arguments about Scotland is actually you could see a bounce with sea vacations. Yeah, but absolutely. But actually, a lot of these trends that uh, Steve and Andrew have been talking about, you're seeing as well potentially <laughs> in Scotland. Is that fair? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the, what the, the challenge, I think, for operators up here at the moment is they're desperate to be open. Obviously, the social distancing uh, considerations are, uh, are grave for them because there aren't any... There's no guidance yet. Nobody knows quite how it's going to play out. Um, the smaller operators, the independent ones, might find it a bit easier to uh, organize those social distancing um, spaces because they own the, the properties in which uh, they'll, people will be. But uh, they're going to have far fewer spaces to hold people. So if you've got a 40 or 50 bedroom hotel or even a 30 bedroom hotel and social distancing dictates that you can only have 15 people in it at a time, then it's not going to be economic to open up. Um, the larger hotels, uh, Gary, um, Gary Atkinson will probably be able to pop in here with a bit of comment about that in a minute, but the larger hotels, I'm not sure how they're going to, to cope. Um, certainly in rural areas in Scotland, um, we haven't seen, I, I live out in the middle of nowhere, in fact, nobody really comes near us because we're so far out, <laughs> we don't get strangers coming past, but we haven't had uh, a great influx of people. I, I'm, I'm joking. There are, there, we have a lot of cycling routes here, and we have a, a, a lot of attractions around here. But um, you, you do see an increase in traffic at the moment from cyclists and from runners. They are finding our routes and they're coming through. But we didn't have any facilities necessarily for them to be camping nearby, so we haven't noticed that yet. What we are waiting to see is what happens when um, when hospitality spaces are. Are opened up again but it's just it's unclear at the moment nobody nobody can really predict it here Gary can I ask you then yeah, I mean I, I'm hearing mixed messages from the, the hoteliers um, not really understanding what's going to happen uh, with the occupancies or volumes they're all obviously understanding that probably catering is not going to play in their game in the short term as hoteliers concentrate on the uh, the rooms. Unlike Alex, I live in the city centre of Glasgow, and the last couple of days when it's been sunny, uh, we have seen a lot more people in the city. Um, going for a walk two days ago in the main uh, square, city centre square, it was very busy, and there isn't social distancing being um, maintained. Um, that That is the, my concern, is how, how we're going to, control the social distancing because again it's all over the news the last couple of days a small beach in Edinburgh Portobello Beach uh, was mobbed absolutely mobbed and, and Alex you must have seen them reports I mean it's just people just mobbed with people and it, absolutely no regard for social distancing um, and that's the concern isn't it as, as we start opening up 
it's ha how do we control that social distancing? Because before long, we'll be back into the virus taking over again. Um, but um, you know, Nick, Nicholas Sturgeon yesterday, uh, and I saw it on the, the Lorraine television show this morning, is still extremely cautious um, uh, about opening up, and, and quite rightly in my mind, because until we get a grip of this social distancing, it is worrying. Warren, maybe I can bring you in from a private members club perspective in, in London. How are you seeing things? Um, yeah, no, um, I suppose the challenge again, I mean, we are in London, so that's the first and foremost is the, obviously the public transport um, for not just members coming in to, to visit us, but certainly uh, staff to be able to serve them um, and the risk associated with that. However, uh, we are now in the, in the process of actually um, utilizing a lot of our banking areas and all that um, and creating workspaces for a lot of Londoners who are coming into work at London all the time uh, who don't want to sit in an office alone working away um, to come in and, and, and do that and obviously social distancing um, from next week we, we decided to now only open probably from the 1st of August uh, which gives us a good bit of time to then go in and, and get the signage up um, screens um, and we are very fortunate that we've got a multitude of um, staircases which would be three separate buildings or combined into one over the years. Um, so we are going to have different routes as well for people to be able to go, which would be a one-way system. Um, so we're very fortunate in the fact that we can actually control that, um, you know, unlike a lot of other people. Um, but the reality remains that, you know, the people actually coming into London, how do you control them mixing? Um, prior to them even coming to your clubhouse and then obviously you know, creating that risk for you as a business um, when they get there. So it's, it's concerning, uh, very concerning, um, because we just don't see how that's going to operate properly um, without mitigating the risk in one way or the other. Fair enough. Um, I suppose also just from a you know, local economy type perspective, we have seen just from businesses around here how communities are investing more and purchasing more locally. So we've got a fishmonger that comes to the square on a Saturday and delivers fish and a, and a fruit and veg farm that um, is taking orders and delivering because we weren't able to get in supermarkets. And quite frankly, lots of people were too scared to go to supermarkets. Um, David, you are very involved in um, um, all things supply chain and uh, we've spoken a few times about how you know local suppliers and well supply chains are some decimated and <laughs> to some certain extent but how local suppliers uh, maybe this is an opportunity for them in more rural areas do you have any thoughts um, I, yeah I have a couple I, I think um, I think there are some really good things happening uh, in the rural economy right now I, I because of the nature of of my work, which is um, which is all about food supply chain, um, I, I personally know quite a number of farmers. Um, many of them have become good friends. Um, and what is happening in farming is that there's a big rethink about what, first of all, about what the role of being a farmer is anyway. Um, and uh, th there are increasing numbers of farmers who are becoming food producers rather than just um, guys who grow fruit and then sell it. Um, but more than that, I, I think there are increasing number of farmers who are realizing that selling locally um, uh, is, is a real option for them. And uh, yeah, I can tell you, there's one guy I know really well in Shropshire who, uh, who is, is absolutely booming and he's actually buying in product uh, from other local producers to resell to his now burgeoning network of local customers and I, I think you know this this is going to become a major part of uh, of the rural economy in the future particularly as at the moment those guys are selling in relatively close to themselves and of course when they get um, when they get a level of uh, critical mass they'll be able to expand their delivery uh, capability out from that central sort of uh, 25 square miles into something much larger. And I, I do think we are going to see a revolution in uh, direct delivered food from farm, which can only be an enormously good outcome from this crisis. Maria, can I bring you in here from a New Zealand perspective? Um, how are you seeing things? I can unmute you. 
I say confidently. No? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, look, this is so valuable for me to just listen to you guys. And um, uh, just underlying everything is the sort of uh, that thread of optimism and hope and resourcefulness. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I work with New Zealand exporters um, with target market, the, t the UK as a target market for their for their products uh, and basically mostly in food and drink, uh, wine and beer, uh, but some consumer goods as well. But uh, so um, New Zealand is um, at now has moved from uh, a level four lockdown, which was similar to our, the lockdown we were in sort of two weeks ago uh, to a level two lockdown. So um, they're kind of moving up. Uh, there's no uh, cases of COVID. Uh, in New Zealand uh, now and um, people coming into the country, the borders are actually closed, but um, people coming into New Zealand are um, quarantining for two weeks before they're being released out into the, into the general public. Um, the uh, coffee shops and cafes and restaurants are beginning to open. Uh, certainly the coffee shops are open. Um, and like the local um, uh, local providers in UK, they're, they're utilising social distancing measures. Uh, so that's where we are there. Um, interestingly, uh, th that pivot into direct-to-consumer has become very strong as well, particularly for the brewers. So um, selling at the barn door kind of thing uh, is very much in vogue at the moment. Um, similar concerns uh, from providers around um, the level of self-control in terms of social distancing. Uh, when you get big groups of people, um, the, 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 um, you know, the social distancing, distancing disciplines seem to um, fall a little bit. Um, the, the latest sort of discussion that um, the Prime Minister is having now is uh, she was talking about um, uh, you know, well, the topic again was raised about a four day week um, for boosting uh, to domestic tourism, internal tourism, because uh, the, the New Zealand borders, I, well, most people anecdotally, we don't think they'll be open until, uh, you know, 2021. So sort of spring of 2021. So um, the economy there is, the tourism economy is so huge. So um, yeah, that's kind of where we are. Um, interestingly, um, the, the supply chains are most affected because, um, um, and, the and the cost of freight has uh, risen massively. So uh, some of my uh, customers are seeing increases in freight charges of up to 150%. Sure. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, it, for some of the larger uh, processors, the land guys and stuff, um, they already have a lot of stock in the UK because food service closed, especially their products tend to be that sort of premium, uh, premium cuts that don't necessarily go into retail. So they've got a lot of that stock. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, I, I think there's real concerns around freight cost. That's probably the issue at the moment. So um, uh, the um, sort of, um, I suppose the the sort of um, innovation there is uh, they're trying to engage more with the, um, you know, that dine at home sector, um, you know, just making baby steps into the dine at home or the um, delivery direct to consumer channels in the UK. But a lot of them weren't ready for that. You know, they were selling into food service or into retail and they didn't really play in that sort of e-commerce space. So it's been very, very challenging for some of our exporters. Yeah, I'm sure. And um, Galia, you're down in Brighton, in addition to being involved in sort of Brighton and the football club, um, you also have an amazing um, ch ch chocolate company yourself as an entrepreneur. So how have you seen things on both sides of that scale? unmute myself yes. um yeah I, I think it's really interesting what's happening in brighton because um 
it, uh, we've kind of at uh, the economy the local economy is really adapting to the situation there's quite a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in brighton anyway there's a lot of innovation there's a lot of um small businesses lots of local businesses and what's happened since the beginning of lockdown actually is that a lot of uh small businesses have joined forces uh, and restaurants um uh, and food service providers to do deliveries so from uh, the local cafe at the top of my road, which is a chain, a Brighton chain, Flower Pot. Um, they actually have always stayed open. So rather than being a cafe where you can sit, they, they put out two big trestle tables and social distancing. So you can see a queue going at the end, you know, uh, of people waiting. From the beginning, they've sold three, every, per day, they sell around 300 loaves of bread. And they're a bakery as well. And then they've added to their offering. So you can... I can go to the top of my road and just buy quite a lot of essentials, but they're also delivering. So you can go on their website, book a click and collect, or they can come and deliver to you. And just um, uh, last week they started to sell coffee as well. So people, I live right by the seafront, so people walking to the beach are stopping off grabbing a coffee and they have a separate uh, area at the side of the cafe where you can go and collect your coffee um, and same on the seafront. I mean, seafront is packed. Um, there is some social distancing and people are very courteous actually. Uh, no one's wearing masks uh, and people, but there's lots of places open. Uh, Morocco's, which is the uh, ice cream and pizza place. Again, they've got outdoors, you can queue and people are buying ice cream. Um, almost all the, not, not uh, quite a lot of the seafront um, cafes and restaurants are selling something to um, the public um, so it seems to be like things are adapting the most interesting thing is that a lot of restaurants are you know whether it's delivery is actually huge every time they're adding new restaurants but um, restaurants are actually emailing customers who've been there on their email list directly so i'm getting emails from restaurants going would you like us to create a meal for you um, here's our direct uh, ordering process. So a lot of people are trying to adapt as much as possible to B2C and selling directly to the consumer um, and delivering. Uh, and then quite a lot of uh, people with vans are, you know, friends of mine, they're doing fish deliveries. They're going to the fishmongers, collecting and delivering to people um, and starting to, to create their own little businesses, delivery businesses, really. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's strange because it it feels that we are in lockdown. It feels like I've also been very sick for, for five five weeks nearly. Um, but things are still happening in Brighton. It feels like things are still continuing uh, in an adapted way. Um, so I think it's a pretty interesting model. Um, in terms of football, there's no football, sadly. Um, uh, we're a small, I, I'm on the board of directors of a small football club, uh, Lewis uh, FC. Uh, what I always say is the first club in the world to pay men and women the same, so equal um, equal pay. Uh, but we, we've had to close down um, everything. We can't, we're trying to work out how we can um, have local matches again with the social distancing. At the moment, the FA isn't giving a lot of guidance. Um, nobody knows what's happening. Uh, and uh, the women's football has now been... Uh, um, terminate so so this this season has ended so um it's it's all up in the air so we're, we're everyone's furloughed we're all trying to to work out what the next steps are really keen to have some kind of um you know uh, football again but for the time being and we actually don't think we'll have any live matches till 2021 uh, yeah, that's, that's the common common theme everywhere yeah. for yeah. Yeah. so yeah Ramesh, can, I, can, I, Ramesh, can i bring you in here <laughs> Yeah, your hat, I, a very impressed hat. Yeah, yeah, um, not sure. I, I think that's because I've got too much hair now. I need hair. <laughs> um, um, you're talking about I, the effect on lawyers recently, yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah I mean, Sam, uh, Simon Calder, who writes for the Independent, described travel as the industry of happiness, and uh, I just wanted to bring a different perspective that we are not going to have 130 million Chinese people going to every part of the world next year. I mean, that's the number that goes out, that's twice our population. And we are therefore in a unique position to say, how do we exploit the opportunities 
uh, in the in the UK because there are two. I mean, in my my experience, there are two types of people: people who travel all around the world first and say, "When I'm no longer able to fly or jump and whatever, I'll travel within my country." And there are others who say, "I'll wait until I'm 60 and then travel the world," and which they won't be doing now. So I think over the next uh, year, uh, year or so, I think there's a fantastic opportunity um, in terms of improving service, improve, making people welcome, getting the right sort of messaging, giving value for money and saying, look, this is a, the most amazing country there is uh, and uh, leaving aside the weather. And, um, and let's, let's, uh, let's all go out and uh, contribute to the economy. And I think, I think there are a lot of people who are actually cancelling their holidays uh, abroad simply to say look we want to show some sort of uh, patriotism loyalty and do these things but on the other hand i think uh, i'm just to say that the other day they said people in skagness they only had one toilet open for disabled people uh, well it was a disabled to uh, toilet and you had to wait 40 minutes to go there and i mean you had to think and say do people not take this into consideration before they get into their cars. So I think there's a question of responsibility on both sides as well. But I think with the right sort of messaging, I'm, I'm, I'm positive. I think there's a fantastic opportunity uh, to really celebrate what's good in this country and sell it as well. I mean, that's a good point. Uh, that's a good point. Look, sorry, just quickly. Uh, but you, you see the effect of the law profession as being quite severe, don't you? Oh, definitely, because I, <laughs> I think firstly, people are questioning and saying, do lawyers actually do anything useful? Well, there is that. <laughs> to to the health service. So I think we're we battling with that first. <laughs> and and then, then I think uh, certainly, certainly, I think uh, you're not going to see a lot of uh, law and accountancy offices opening in a hurry because people have got used to delivering uh, work very efficiently from home. And also, I think. Uh, uh, we could see a situation where people go down to four, four, four days a, a week. And I think people are being equally productive as well, because I think productivity has always been a problem here. So I like the idea of what they're doing in New Zealand, saying we have an extra day to go and uh, enjoy what Britain has to But that again depends on, I mean, if you haven't got a job, if you haven't got money, and if, if you're on furlough, you, is that delaying the inevitable? And therefore, what do you do? I mean, this is all very well, but if I've got no money, where can I travel? Yeah. Andrew, bringing you back in again, you represent a lot of London venues. Andrew? Is there? Not there? Gone. I need to unmute, sorry. Uh, no worries. You represent a lot of London venues. Yes. Which must be one of the hardest, hardest markets to recover. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I think a lot of people in the hospitality industry have been given signs of recovery, um, whether that's small groups, letting people go out, but everything that we deal with is, um, you know, we work with a lot of museums um, and how they can monetize themselves after, um, after the museum is shut for events, weddings and that kind of thing. And we've not once heard any indication of anything about any group above 30. So as far as we're concerned, um, you know, this is this is a this goes on in deep into next year um, until anything is found. Because, as I say, everybody that we work with is looking for hundreds to five hundreds um, upwards, which, you know, there is no indication. And whilst they can try very hard to create new scenarios of how people sit at dinner for 500. Um, it's the back of house, how do you cope with the kitchens? Um, it's the loos, all of those kind of facilities, how you get people in through one entrance and back out through another. Um, <coughs> the, the ramifications are, are ridiculous, which is, um, well, I think the, you know, there will be a big disbursement of out of London um, for, uh, leisure and sort of visiting friends and relatives which is why I um, was interested in, in what Steve was saying just how the rural sort of economy was looking at things um, but I think from big events it's a it's a long 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 way off um, and you know anything that's put out <laughs> never mentions them um, any government no, no, advice no. and it's, it's sad. And what's the morale like among the venues? Can I ask you? Um, a lot of, I mean, I would say, well, 
like everyone else, 80% 80 of people are on furlough. So most of my clients are on furlough. Some, some are around and about and put, you know, putting on a brave face. Um, and I think they're being a lot more realistic and just saying, okay, well, we need to, to realize that then that events are going to go virtual um, and, you know, really embracing the technology and that kind of thing. There's another school of thought that is, as soon as corporates can bring people back together, they're going to have to re-motivate their people, um, you know, and just say thank you for working from home for so long. Um, so there might be events there, but I think the reality is, though, these big corporates that have these big, beautiful offices will do them in their big, beautiful atriums rather than spending fifteen to twenty thousand pounds on just hiring a, a standout venue, you know, even before the catering and anything else has gone on it. No, thank so. You. It's a big shift. No, thank you. Jill, can I, Jill McMillan, can I bring you in here? Uh, Jill's an expert in leadership development. Um, I suppose one of the questions to all this is how people still carry on engaging or leaders can carry on engaging their teams. Because that seems to be one of the big challenges, I think, as we, as we come back. Is that fair? I think that's very fair. Uh, hello, everyone. It's been fascinating listening to you all. Yeah, I, I am. I'm an executive coach. I work individually with leaders, uh, as well as uh, their teams. Um, and luckily, we've been working in this kind of online sphere for a while, so there's nothing particularly new to me. Although teams are really struggling to get used to this this new way of interacting with each other. I think. I mean. What I'm seeing at the moment, I'm, I'm, the way I'm working with teams is, is both helping them think through the short term and the, the kind of practical, the practicalities of dealing with what is essentially deep fear. And, you know, we've mentioned that on the call this morning, but also helping them think through how do we act and lead with compassion when people are having very, very different reactions to this, very human, very personal and diverse reactions to this. So I think a lot of the short term is meeting people where they're at and having patience with uh, different types of reactions. Um, people are, are, do interesting things during times of stress and pressure and we all react differently. So I think leaders getting used to listening very carefully to what's not being said, which of course is doubly challenging when a lot of the interaction is online and you're only seeing like little little faces so actually reading the room is becoming something that is extremely important and many leaders are not equipped to do so i'm spending a lot of time helping leaders think think through that and working out how to translate that um kind of compassionate um service leadership uh, to a, a, an online world um but in in addition to that, I think it's also important that teams are thinking beyond and it's been um, really heartful to me hearing um, words like opportunity and thinking ahead because there are some amazing things happening and, and part of the work that we're doing is both helping leaders to think through the practicalities of the, the immediate and the short term, but also giving hope to teams to start to think about what next and how do we build on the great stuff that's happening and then start to even reimagine what life will look like beyond it, it, and of course i work across um, many industries but listening to you all today it's making me think i've got big questions about how high streets are reimagined um, both i mean i'm fascinated to see what's going to happen in london but also in rural communities what does that look like how do we provide experiences um, my husband is a head teacher uh, in, in two schools, he's an executive head across two schools in central London. Many of his families are living in high rises in Woolwich and Lewisham and are having, as you can well imagine, a horrendous time right now. We're lucky to live in rural Surrey and uh, fairly near Gatwick and I'm having a wonderful time having no planes overhead. So the experience is, is so vastly different, but we are going to have to think about how do we give families um, even day trips, what, what, do that, what does that look like if we can't go to these really popular destinations? Is there an opportunity to attract families and, and couples um, to, to different destinations and provide experiences? That, that feels like a real opportunity. I think also distributing people away from the, the hotspots 
um, where are they going to go? How could we reimagine that? I mean, I'm Scottish, you might hear from my accent, but, um, you know, there's a concern, I suppose, a, a around, you know, the, the, how do we maintain these beautiful natural environments and at the same time be compassionate to the people who need to get out of the city? Um, and I think the, the final thing I'd say, just as food for thought, that is certainly going through my mind in the work that I do is how do we make experiences online uh, more engaging? Uh, now, I think technology will help with this because I'm sure there are clever people as we speak designing technology, even on Zoom within the year, I, I would hope that we have the kind of technology where we can be more natural and talk over each other. But I suspect there will be um, a, real, a, a real kind of uh, acceleration of the technology that allows us to have better experiences online. And, and I hope that is the case because at the moment it is quite sterile and difficult. And, um, you know, if we are going to be spending a lot more time at home, it feels really important that we can reach through the screen and really engage with, as Vicky said, you know, the, the op open arms and hearts. I love that, that expression. And yet this very sterile flat screen is a real, um, yeah, barrier to, 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 to entry. Um, that's my tuppence worth. Thank you, Chris, for the opportunity. It's, it's, no, it's a pleasure. And in terms of feedback from leaders, quickly, what's their bigger concern of this? Because a lot of your clients are corporates, I assume, I think, from our conversations. Um, and yet they're going to be working, uh, obviously, operating remote or managing remote teams. Are they, are they comfortable with that? Or is that the struggle? I think, of course, it's a struggle, but I think if I could stay with the positive and the opportunity, I think what a lot of teams are finding, and I'm certainly finding this with my own clients, is that the opportunity is for greater authenticity. You know, at the moment, we are being given a real insight into people's home lives. I mean, the number of times I've been on a, on a call with a, uh, with a client and a child has run into the room or, or um, there's, there's been a cat jumped <laughs> on top of the desk. Um, there's moments for lightness. There's moments for, there's an opportunity to get to know people in a more human, human way. And um, I think uh, your industry is one that can really, really accelerate that actually. Um, I think leaders who are, have already been doing work on themselves, uh, it, developing their own ability to connect in a deeper way are doing better at the moment. The ones that are struggling are those who are still in frankly an old school mindset of command and control and are not used to working in this way. They're not used to being vulnerable and, and opening themselves up to um, a, a different way of working. So I think um, we're going to have to, certainly it's a focus in, in, in my business right now, all of my associates are spending time coaching people in this new world. But those leaders that are going to win, let's say, are the ones that can really um, begin again, as it were. And I, I, they're open to, to the vulnerability that this new world um, is, is putting onto all of us. No, oh, that's a fascinating. Thank you for that, Jill. Very interesting. Uh, Sarah, can I bring you in from Ascot? How are you seeing that change? Are you there? She is there. You have to unmute, I'm afraid. Yes, I'm here now. <laughs> how, how are you finding your local economy change? Because obviously you normally have Ascot at this time of year or just coming up and that would I assume be happening. Well, actually, interesting, there hasn't been anything to say it isn't happening. So I think just everybody is assuming this isn't happening. But of all the things that have been cancelled, there's been absolutely no mention of Ascot at all. So, um, I, funny enough, I was, I was walking out yesterday and the, all the big signs for when it's happening and the dates in June and everything are exactly as they were. There's no sort of it won't be happening or, or anything. It's actually quite bizarre. So I don't know whether it's just a sort of an accepted thing that it won't and everybody just knows it won't. Um, but in, term, in terms of Ascot as a whole, it's, it's manically busy. Um, lots and lots of people out, huge amounts of people out in the woods walking, 
um, the shops are open, a lot of the uh, sort of eateries are now all reconditioned themselves to um, takeaway and or delivery. Um, even the local off license will deliver if you order over 50 pounds worth of alcohol. So I'm sure they must be doing really well. Um, so I'd, yeah, it's, it's, it's busy here. And is, is there a change on the high street or not? You're going to see change um, on the street? I think that's one of the interesting pieces. The, the, it's quite, it's definitely quieter. It's definitely much more busy this last um, week or so. Um, but people are very happy. They they queue outside the supermarkets. They uh, the butcher has reinvented himself so that you can't actually go into the butchers anymore. He's sort of got his his uh, one of his tables right at the door, so that you, you, only one person can go to the door, order their meat and, and be given it, and they walk off, and the next person who's queuing in the street does the same thing. So um, the bank's the same. Um, I, I suppose it's changed in the fact that instead of there being a bunch of milling people around, everybody's lined up um, sort of with their, with their distancing from each other. But um, yeah, it's busy. Thank you. Look, I, a, thank you. I'm just conscious of the time and coming to the end. As always with these sessions, uh, I think we get more questions than answers, which is one of the really interesting things of this moment. And I think there's some really interesting challenges coming up. Uh, Steve, firstly, thank you very much for your introduction today. Uh, can we all say to say thank you to Steve? Um, it's been very helpful to everyone. Uh, very helpful. Um, I think we, we all know we face some really interesting challenges coming up. And actually, how the, how the local economies react, I think, will be really crucial to how we rebuild. Um, so it'll be an interesting one to watch as it all unfolds. Uh, so can I say thank you to all of you today? Um, we've, again, recorded this. Um, so we'll be releasing the recording a bit later as well for those who want to listen. And uh, thank you. Have a great weekend. Yeah, as thank you. And it's a long weekend. So enjoy Bank Holiday Monday. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.